Hey everybody, this is Steve. Now today I want to talk about why one of the really early books on neuro-linguistic programming is still quite important to neuro-linguistic programming students, even though it's 40 years old and a lot of the information within it is really obsolete. Um, it's Frogs into Princes. It was published in 1979 and it's essentially written from the seminars of the two main founders of neuro-linguistic programming, uh, Richard Bandler and John Grinder. Like I said, it was published in 1979. It does make it 40 years old. But there's still something important in these really early books of NLP, which you really do not get in most of the modern books on NLP. And in this video, I'm going to explain why that is. I'm going to explain why these books are still important. I'm going to explain in what ways the information are obsolete. But I'm also going to point at where there is some really rich and useful information that is worth absorbing from these books. And stay with me till the end, because I'm going to point at some very specific things which I think modern students of neuro-linguistic programming should pay attention to. Now, I myself am an advanced master practitioner and trainer of neuro-linguistic programming. I've been involved with neuro-linguistic programming for nearly 20 years now. Uh, I've taught many NLP programs myself, including cert certification programs, and I've assisted on many other people's trainings too. And unlike a lot of people who have done maybe one, two or three short NLP courses, I've done well over 120 days in classrooms plus practice groups with some of the greatest NLP trainers in the world, including people who are very outspoken about what's missing from a lot of modern NLP training. And I'll try to put some of that across. So if this is of interest to you, please do click like. And please also, if you're interested in this or more content like it, including future videos, which will also be looking at other books of NLP, then please click the subscribe button and hit the notifications bell. Now, the first question you might have on your minds is, why wouldn't this book still be important? Well, in simple terms, as I said, it was published in 1979 and it's old and NLP has changed a lot. If you take Richard Bandler, for example, who is one of the co-founders of neurolinguistic programming, he is a prolific and quick creator. He's always experimenting. He's always looking for better ways of doing things. And he's constantly adding to his personal repertoire from his experimentations and dropping things from his personal repertoire when he's found better ways of doing things. And in simple terms, a lot of what's in that book has been moved on from. Now, to give one example about how NLP has moved on in these years, in the very early days, NLP borrowed ideas from linguistics and transformational grammar. And one of the main idioms that was taught in NLP was this idea of the deep structure and the surface structure. Now, I have to say a lot of books and courses get this wrong. A lot of them say that the deep structure is the sensory experience, the non-linguistic experience, and the surface structure is the language that you're trying to use to express it. And that's incorrect. If you actually look right back into uh, the structure of magic and also transformational grammar itself, both the deep structure and the surface structure were linguistic structures. The deep structure was, for want of a better phrase, the fully formed language, and the surface structure was the reduced version of it. And the sensory experience was something below both of those. So it's one of the ways that a lot of books and courses actually even get that model wrong. But my real point in bringing this up is that linguists abandoned that as the wrong concept like 40 years ago. You know, it's only neuro-linguistic programmers that still talk about deep structure and surface structure as if that's the current way of thinking about linguistics. And it's not. Another example of the way that NLP has changed a lot in the last 40 years is to look at its principal or one of its principal models, certainly one of its earliest models, the meta model. Now, in its very early days, the meta model was taught like a very simple stimulus response model. You hear this language pattern, you ask that question. Now, the trouble with that is it meant that there was lots of questions being asked with no real purpose or order or sequence uh, and it became known as meta-monstering. 
Now, one of the, the other things about NLP is that there hasn't been one single linear track of development. Basically, lots of people have gone off and developed their own things, and they don't necessarily all link up. So to a large extent, it's really hard to track and itemize the way that models have been developed because different people have developed them in different ways. But there's been lots of development around the meta model. Some people have developed it into a model for getting precision out of language. Uh, there have been developments to put intent, order and sequencing to the way that we use it. Um, other people have developed ways of asking fewer, higher, more powerful questions. Uh, one example of an exercise that came up well after Frogs into Princes, for example, was the so-called one question exercise, where the idea is you, you listen, you gather a bunch of information, and you construct one question that both gathers powerful information and causes a powerful shift at the same time. So there's lots of development of things like the meta-model all over the place that have changed since these early days of NLP. I don't think that the idea of NLP was ever to come up with a fixed set of ideas and models and techniques and call that NLP. As Richard Bandley himself says, the techniques are really the byproduct of NLP, but what NLP itself actually is, is that attitude and methodology, the attitude and methodology of inquisitiveness, of modeling, of discovery, and of coding what you find. And what really separates that kind of neuro-linguistic programming practitioner from maybe the other kinds is that they're not just applying fixed ideas, techniques, and models. They are engaging in that attitude methodology of discovery, of exploration, of finding out what works and what doesn't for themselves. So what is valuable about these old NLP books? Well, if you look at a lot of the modern NLP books, what they do, uh, they convey in bullet points uh, patterns and models. They convey in bullet points techniques. And that's a fine way of conveying ideas. But what it doesn't bring across is what, what I think NLP is really about, which is the attitude and methodology, the attitude of inquisitiveness, the attitude of exploration, the methodology of exploration and discovery and coding things. In other words, what a lot of modern NLP books and courses seem to do is they seem to treat NLP like it's become a fixed, closed, and just so system of knowledge and techniques. And I really do not think that was the original intention. And one of the values you get when you read these old books, which, as you can see, are much more narrative. They're not bullet point based. There's humor and anecdotes and stories. And how did we discover this? Uh, and how did we code that? And how did we experiment with this? That comes across in these books in a way that doesn't come across in these bullet point books. Another thing that's been lost from these old NLP books, uh, as we've gone to the new NLP books, is context. What was the context in which some of these original ideas were put forward? Uh, so in this book, uh, when you read about well-formed outcomes, you realize something. The way well-formed outcomes are taught in modern NLP is almost like it's a, a goal-setting system, like the SMART goal-setting system. But when you actually read about well-formed outcomes in this book, what you actually realize is it wasn't really intended like this, that the whole idea of well-formed outcomes, the full name of which, by the way, is the well-formedness conditions for outcomes in therapy. You might update that to say the well-formedness conditions for outcomes in change work, to be more general. Um, but when you read about it in this book, what you realize is that it's actually a, for want of a better phrase, a meta strategy for the whole process of leading somebody through therapeutic change. In other words, you keep redirecting people towards what they want rather than what they don't want. You keep redirecting people to what they can own in terms of change versus what they can't own in terms of change. You keep dealing with the ecology problems as they come up, uh, and you keep dealing with the secondary gains as they come up, and you keep using see, hear, feel experiences as a way of directing 
the change. So that's why I think these old books are important, even if the information in them is to a large extent obsolete because NLP changes a lot and has changed in multiple different directions. There is something about these books which, which convey the context with which certain ideas were put forward. And there's something about these books which say something about the attitude and the methodology of NLP that really doesn't come across from those bullet-pointed books which just list presuppositions and models and techniques. Now, if you're interested in neuro-linguistic programming, and if you're a professional person, I would say that you should be, then do subscribe to this channel because I will talk about more books and ideas around neuro-linguistic programming in the future. Just hit that subscribe button and click the notifications bell. Please do like this video as well, share it with your friends, comment, tell me about your experiences with NLP and what you think about this book too, and I'll try my best to respond. And other than that, I'll see you next week.